Well, thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to Canberra. Or Pornborough, as some people are calling it these days. Yes, for all its charms, Canberra is now the last bastion of legal pornography in Australia. The sale of X-rated videos has been banned in all the states now, but they're still perfectly legal in the territories, the Northern Territory and the ACT. So every year, four or five hundred thousand of these X-rated videos are bundled up in plain wrappers and sent off from here to mail order uh, subscribers all around Australia. It's a huge industry. In fact, it's said to be worth uh, upwards of $25 million a year to the ACT. But a lot of people here don't like it one little bit. And in fact, half our audience tonight wants to see it closed down. In particular, Dennis Stevenson. Now, Mr. Stevenson is a member of the ACT Assembly here. And he put a bill before the uh, Assembly to ban X-rated videos in the ACT. When it was debated uh, six or seven weeks ago, it was defeated by a single vote, but it's still on the table of the House. And Mr. Stevenson says he's absolutely confident that by the end of the year, he'll get the extra vote that he needs. And he's now saying today, by the way, that he's got evidence of links between uh, organised crime and the X-rated video industry that he intends to put before the Assembly next week, and that will clinch his case. Well, in the meantime, of course, the future of X-rated videos, uh, well, in the whole of Australia, hangs in the balance. But before we get involved in the rights and wrongs of all this, I think we need to understand a little bit about what's involved in the industry, what's in an X-rated video. Now, Mark, you, you and Ellie have been in, you've been in one movie, you've appeared in one movie, you're going to appear in another one, haven't you? Yes. You glory under the title Mark Ramjet. That can't be your real name, but this is the name you use for the purpose of the movies, right? Tell us a little bit about what you and Ellie were expected to do in this movie. We were just expected to be caring towards each other and just act naturally and just do what we did at home. Yeah. And, we and what's that? Well, just a normal, healthy, good sex life for two young people. You know? Was it? Uh, were you able to be spontaneous about this? I mean, yeah. you have to do takes and retakes no, like they do in normal movie making? It was spontaneous. You know, I didn't have any qualms about it. And... Uh, that was just it. What about you, Ellie? Well, I feel the same way. You know, first asked to do the first movie. I had my doubts about it. And after coming up here and doing the movie, I done extremely well with all the crew and just made more or less fall into doing the part. And you didn't feel at all inhibited about having no. to have sex in front of a whole film crew? No. I found it was just a natural thing. You thought if his clothes off that was a cameraman in the room. And just more or less do it as you normally would at home. But I mean, what, well, what happens in these situations? You've got a whole crew in the room, a director. You've yeah. got a scenario, presumably, that you're working to. What, what happens? You, what, you take your clothes off and go to it and they film, do they? Yeah, well, you, you don't take it too seriously. You have a bit of a joke and laugh at the crew. Naturally, you just get on really well with them. And, um, it's just more or less, does really make you feel at ease about it. Mm. And can you tell us what sort of money you get paid for doing one of these blue movies? It's extremely good. Yeah. Is that why you did it? Or yes, that's, you... the, that's the main reason why we did it, yeah. Oh. What, easy money? Yeah, easy money. It's something you enjoy. Oh. Well, Guy, you've made a couple of these, uh, you've appeared in a couple of these uh, movies too, yeah. haven't you? What, uh, what sort of things uh, were you asked to do in the movies you appeared in? Just ordinary natural things that you, you would do any, every other day. Um, nothing out of the ordinary. Mm-hmm. How, um, I, I mean, uh, there was a script, presumably, that you worked yes, with? Yes, <laughs> I play the character. Um, I was stuck by the script. Mm-hmm. What was the character? What, uh, what, what was mm-hmm. the nature of this? Um, I play the lifesaver, actually. A lifesaver? Yeah. And, and what did the lifesaver do? Um, I'm just interested in getting some idea of what, what storylines uh, um, lie behind some of these X-rated movies. Well, I just I was talking to my partner about what we'd do for our holidays and where we'd go for our next holiday, and I sort of reminisced about the year before. Right, reminisced about all your sexual adventures the year yeah. before, which were then acted out. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and when you were doing your filming, did you have to do retakes? I mean, uh, I'm just interested in how difficult it is well, to do course, all this. I mean, of course, there's bloopers like in anything. How do you um, have a blooper in a blue movie? movie. <laughs> <laughs> we have lots of bloopers. I mean, there was one scene where we were doing, um, I was lying down on the beach and we had the waves coming up around me. 
And every time that they started filming, a ginormous wave would come and knock me flying. Yeah. So just sort of, sort of blew this like that. Yeah. And presumably you've got to be able to maintain an erection for quite a time through a lot of this. Uh, Very hard. <laughs> are, you, are you going to tell us how you do that? Um, very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, how were you recruited? I mean, what persuaded you to I was get into... I was you were doing some part-time modelling, I think, anyway, yeah. weren't you? Yeah. No, I was approached and I thought I'd do it. And well, Brazil, I, I gather that you also paid quite good money and for the yes. same reason that uh, Mark and Ellie did it, it was mm -hmm. easy money for you. Yes. Yeah. Did you have any qualms about having to, uh, you know, perform sexually in front of a whole film crew? Um, no, well, I mean, you could, you didn't have to have the old, the whole crew, crew, the crew there if you didn't want to. Uh -huh. There, you can only have the cameraman. And, and it doesn't worry you that, uh, well, heaven knows how many hundreds of thousands of people are watching you having sex on this video. Not at all. Does it, um, I'm just interested, uh, those of you who perform in these movies, does it, when you're doing this sort of thing, um, I mean, it can't be too spontaneous. It really can't be if there's a crew there filming it all when you're, when you're acting it out in a sort of ritual like that. Does it interfere with your personal sexual relationships? No. No? No, I didn't find it at all, no. Yeah. Well, um, Lisa Nitsky, you, you've reviewed a lot of these movies, I think, haven't you? For a, for a, a review show. Uh, in fact, I think you've watched something like three and a half thousand, four thousand of them. Three and a half thousand, I believe. It's difficult to keep track. <laughs> yeah. Give us an idea of the sort of material then that uh, that appears on these X-rated videos. Well, ordinarily, when I review a film, I review it prior it going to the classification board. Uh, the film will be imported into the country, and I'll have a look at it and then send it to them. Oh. Uh, so usually, I'm looking for certain aspects in the film. I can tell you now that we certainly don't have sexual violence in X-rated films mm. and uh, anything that was slightly violent obviously goes straight back to where it came from. Yeah, I'm just interested in the sort of material that you, appear, that you, that you see in these, these movies. Well, like all films, there's good and bad films, Peter. You'll find that the vast majority are, fa are fairly cold. I mean, they, they have plots, they do have a storyline, they have a scenario that allows you to go into a sexual uh, escapade of some sort. Uh, and that could be anything from, uh, let's pretend, uh, a lady meets a gentleman outside of the office and they go for a drink and then they go home and they, they have sex. Or it uh, could be a more grand production. Sometimes we have things like a, a take-off of My Fair Lady where you actually have a, a full cast in period costume and all that sort of thing. Uh, some of them are highly... Some of them have large budgets mm. and some of them don't. So, as I say, they're like all films. There's good and bad. Mm. I was going to say, what makes a good blue movie in your estimation? In my estimation, there's several things. One is that the production is, is smooth. Uh, the same thing you'd look for in an ordinary film. Uh, the other thing, I guess, is the, the degree of eroticism. Now, occasionally you'll find a film, when I say occasionally, there's a lot of films that I don't find erotic at all because they're merely clinical close-ups of uh, sexual parts while people are having sex. Mm. I don't think it's harmful, but it's certainly not titillating or erotic. Uh, there is, however, been a number of movies made that I find extremely erotic because of the way they've been filmed. Usually they don't use graphic close-ups. Mm. So what makes what makes good erotica on these uh, these X-rated videos? So difficult to describe without actually being able to show you an example. But mm. the, the same thing that makes uh, a good film: good lighting, good sets, good direction, well acted roles, uh, nicely dressed, uh, a rapport between the two actors, or what have you. Uh, those types of elements. Same thing you look for in a film. Mm. Um, John Lark, you're generally regarded as the Mr. Big of the legal X-rated video industry because you distribute, uh, I think, most of them, most of the legal X-rated videos in Australia. Are these, uh, I'm just interested in the sort of people who are involved in the industry, the sort of people who make them. Are these, uh, are the Guy and Mark and Elliot, are typical they typical of the sort yeah, of people who are here? So. Um, yes, we find that um, the people that we employ are a cross-section of community, as is uh, the people on our list. Uh, the last survey we took of our consumer base, 70% uh, were uh, couples, 60% married, 10% uh, de facto. So uh, it's just um, it's ordinary people in the industry. There's people that do get excited with uh, um, sexual titillation, sexual stimulation. So what sort of sexual titillation feels best? I mean, what sorts of things are the consumers, those ordinary people you talk about, most interested in? 
Uh, a number of things. I mean, for instance, we did a film, uh, we bought a film, Deep Throat 2. Obviously, because it was the follow-up to the original Deep Throat, it had a <coughs> the title appeal. Sold the title sold that. Uh, then we did another one, which was uh, Diary of a Chambermaid, which was um, sort of a Mills and Boone type story, but it had, uh, it was classified X, it had uh, graphic sex through, through the film. So it depends, it varies. A lot of it is the title. Um, a lot of it is the cover, the presentation, the models in it. Uh, Ginger Lynn's got a big following. Seeker's got a big following. Uh, there's, there's quite a number of reasons that uh, we're based on a bestseller. Is. All right, well, perhaps some of you people who like watching uh, X-rated videos can tell us about the sort of material that you see, why you watch them, what you get out of them, and so on. Donna, you've, um, you, I think you t tell me that you you watched your first X-rated movie at age 14. Yes. Um, I was still at high school and I went to a girls' school. I was 14 years old and I got home one night and I just, mum and dad had the videos there and put away. And um, I don't know, I think I got mainly bored and I just got out one of these videos and the first one it was, it was a real strange one called Bang Bang Pussycat. And bang I just, Bang Pussycat. <laughs> yeah. um, I just put it on and I wanted to see mm. what it was basically simply because I'd, uh, I heard about pornographic videos and books and that, mm. but I never really took an interest in it. And what did you make of that at age 14? At age 14, I found it very exciting. Um, well, sexually you know, stimulating. Yeah, mm. very sexually stimulating. I didn't really take an interest in boys until I was about 14 and a half, 15. And uh, when I first saw this, I thought, you know, it's really nice. There's something there. It's like having sex without actually having a partner. Mm. And it, it really felt nice. And from then on, my father, my mum came out, and my father said, what the hell are you doing? Mm. My mum just sort of stood there with her mouth dropped to the floor, and oh, my God. Mm. Now a young lady at that stage still at school watching them and reading things like that. And then later on, mum and dad just thought, well, there's heaps of them in there. You want to watch them? Go for your life. And you've continued to watch yeah. them, of course. I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with them. You know, just because there's male and female in them that are having sexual pleasures together in, with each other in these videos doesn't mean to say that there's something wrong with them. It's a natural thing to occur. And, and you suggest that you've found them quite helpful, yeah. your well, sex life. They've helped me a lot because I was engaged the first time and um, my first engagement broke right through because of my fiancé. My second one was going downhill and when I went back to watching them, they really actually helped me because I was doing some things wrong. I was, so at one stage, I was too scared to even undress with the lights on and my boyfriend watching me. I couldn't handle that. I had to have the lights completely off the room, it had to be dark. And I was sitting down watching these movies. They taught me something like, trust yourself and believe in yourself. Don't get all shriveled up and scared because some of So it made you more confident yeah. and more seductive. Yeah. What about some of you others, some of you other consumers? Well, Basically, um, my wife and I watch them, uh, generally from a stimulating point of view, and uh, find them an excellent, uh, I suppose, uh, lead up to foreplay, or a form of foreplay to a certain extent. Do you, um, I, mean, I assume you're, uh, right. is what? Yes. Uh, do you find, you, you also find them stimulating, do you? Yes, I do. Because one theory has been put forward that women aren't stimulated by pornography in the same way that men are. I'm just interested. I do Donna find, she certainly was. I do find it stimulating, of course, nothing to face with the physical aspect of sex. But yes, I do find it stimulating. And they are, um, yes, they are a, a form of foreplay, I suppose. Uh -huh. What about some of you others? Consumers? I think it's had a little bit of a zing into your life. Um, I don't say you use them all the time, but uh, they're certainly something that gives you a few ideas anyway. Right. Helpful. Yes. Stimulating and helpful. Yes, you, you were going to make a point? Yes, I was only going to say that I agree with all of those comments and that I think that personally um, we look at them exactly the same as other movies as to what they are. and Whether they're good or not. Whether they're good or not. And uh, it, it's the same thing as, as any other movie. It's the acting, it's the, the production, um, the way it's done. And, and you watch some... them with your partner as a couple. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and the issue really is, is whether they are good movies as a movie rather than the subject content in the first place. What sort of material do you all like watching? Well, Am I, I allowed to ask that? <laughs> a long time ago when my wife and I used to watch movies, we used to watch things like Emmanuel and the story of O and they were basically R-rated movies, but they had that eroticism. Mm. But 
I think is lacking in some X-rated movies. Yes. But then again... They, they were less explicit than some of these. Well, yeah, of course, movies. but they had that erotic sort of uh, aura about yeah. them. Now, movies of, of X-rated or NBE type classification um, show the full explicit sort of sex. Mm. But if you can, if you shop around and you have a look around and you, you watch them and you just treat them as any other movie and you judge them by actors and storylines and whatever, you can come across some pretty decent movies. Mm. So you're, you, you really find erotica more stimulating than the straight explicit sex acts? Yeah, well, I think everyone does. I mean, no one wants to watch the same thing over and over and over, like just, you know, one, one scene after another. I mean, that's what I wonder. I mean, sexual intercourse is sexual intercourse, and I know there are an in infinite variety of positions and so on, but uh, when you've seen one or two, have you seen the lot? No, well, that's a, I think that's an old cliche that if people... I mean, I used to say that when I was in the Navy. I mean, we used to have them shoved down our throat, put on an overhead projector at 17 years old. But, you know, you've seen one, you've seen them all. But nowadays, um, me being involved no. in the industry, I see a big variety of things, and I, can, I actually sell them on phone. And, I mean, people ask me, what do I recommend? And anything with a storyline with a bit of eroticism is going to be a big seller. Yeah. Well, um, Dennis Stevenson, you don't just object to X-rated videos. To say, you object very strongly to some of the material that you have seen in these, uh, in these videos. I mean, what is it? Can you describe for us what you've seen in these videos that makes them so objectionable to you? First of all, Peter, very few people understand what is contained within the range of X-rated videos. This is one of the legally available X-rated videos in Canberra throughout Australia. Dungeon of Pain. It's indeed. Mm. Throughout Australia, it's banned in every state, but in Canberra, it's allowable. Now, what it contains is bondage. It contains what could perhaps be referred to as non-violent whipping. Mm. And that's where someone is whipped with a cut of nine tails. And the suggestion is that there are no wheels on the body. There are no cuts and that that's not the actual act of whipping, but there are many things that are portrayed on X-rated videos, like incest in movies like Daddy's Little Girl and Sister Dearest and so on. The actual act may not be incestuous, but the portrayal is. The gift. Absolutely. It's the same as child pornography. Within um, video movies that are legally allowable under X-rated, you'll find captions saying the sports coach of a girl's school has a wild night of sex with two students. And you've got uh, sorority, schoolgirls, first time at Cherry High and so on. Mm. So the range of things is very important. So a lot of girls may be over the age of 18, which makes it legal. The suggestion is that these are schoolgirls. They're dressed, the young looking girls, they're dressed as schoolgirls, they may have flats and so on. And what you also find is, um, you'll find voyeurism there, people being peeping toms, obscene phone calls, and various other activities. Mm. Some, some of you others, what have you, you're, well, Dawn Casley Smith, what have, what have you seen in these videos that yeah, you find so um, objectionable? Oral and group sex is mandatory in X rated films, according to Mr. Lark's evidence to the um, committee. And homosexual acts, anal sex um, is in these films. And we are also very concerned about the age portrayed in these films, as Ben has said. We're finding that younger uh, the girls may be 18 years of age but they're using girls who look very very young they're shaving the body hair including the pubic hair they're dressing them in school uniforms little girl dresses and surrounding them with with images of childhood toys dolls santa claus now we're very concerned about this um, um, for obvious reasons, yes. child abuse because of the implications yes that, that because of the you would illusion, argue that will illusion. flow on from this. yes David Haynes, I'd like to hear from you here, because you're one of the people responsible for making the classifications on these, and uh, undoubtedly, like Lisa Miske, you've watched more of these than anybody else in Australia. What criteria do you use to decide if something is going to be acceptable for an X rating? I mean, we've heard a wide description of some of this material now. Yes, the, uh, the, there are widespread misconceptions about what is actually contained in X. The X classification material contains explicit depictions of sexual activity between consenting adults. There is no violence of any kind in X. There is no sexual violence. There is no uh, coercion of any kind. No, there must be no coercion, no violence. That's right. There's and no, presumably no sex with no, minors. No sex with minors. No child pornography. Uh, I think it's important to remember that the guidelines have developed over a period of time and certainly there are 
material there is material out there which at one stage the board may have classified x which today may not be included uh, but i think the sort of material which has been referred to the uh, material where uh, people are dressed in school girl school outfits, outfits. In flats and so on represents a fairly small proportion and certainly over the last couple of years we have been refusing to classify depictions of uh, exploitative incest fantasies uh, this has been a, a fairly recent development, but it... What is exploitative incest fantasy? Well, one which puts forward the idea of incest as being something which yeah. is an attraction. Dreaming about cool girls. Yes, that sort of thing. Yes. Mm. But the, the sort of material that uh, Dennis Stevens <clears throat> described, I mean, bondage, I mean, that suggests violence pretty strongly. Now, I know a lot of people enjoy bondage. It's, yes. uh, but bondage, th there are degrees of these things, obviously, and uh, uh, bondage is a fetish. Uh, which can be either mild or extreme. So that's not regarded as violent, so that's acceptable on an extreme. If it's video. very mild fetishistic activity, uh, we will encompass that sort of uh, activity in an X classification. But if there is uh, any suggestion of coercion or pain or cruelty, then the film is refused. See, none of you over here were talking about the whippings and the bondage and the uh, young women made to look schoolgirls and so on. We get a very different image of uh, X-rated videos from these people. Yes. Well, that's possibly because they are, as said, a very small proportion of the films that are currently being uh, churned out in the industry. Now, you will also find in other categories of film certain uh, depictions available that not all of us would agree with. Now, I watched an R-rated film called Silent Night, Deadly Night the other night that portrayed a Father Christmas killing people. Now, obviously, that's not indicative of all R-rated films. And neither is the fact that there is bondage available in some uh, in, in some X-rated films. And as David said, we're talking about mild fetishes, not heavy whipping. You also, David, made the point to Dennis that uh, some of the material they're talking about was put through classification board very early in the piece before the guidelines were refined. Dungeon of Pain is one of those tapes, which I believe that the stores don't any longer carry. Mm. Well, look, just just let's move along to some of the specific objections here. I mean, we've, we've discussed the broad range of material that is acceptable and, and therefore legal on these videos. I'm just interested in some of the some of the essential points of objection. Why you think these things should not be, uh, these people say they enjoy watching them, why they shouldn't continue to go and enjoy watching them. Now, I think, um, well, some of you here, I think, argue that these are degrading to women and therefore should not be acceptable uh, by community standards. Would some of you like to... A lot of the dangers that, that I see in X-rated videos have already been mentioned by the people who support them. And without becoming terribly personal, a lot of the criticism of X-rated videos is about their mindlessness. And I wouldn't consider our three friends in the front as being tremendous actors and actress. And it just seems to me that there's that there's hardly any artistic development whatsoever for the voyeurs who watch X-rated videos. Uh. The second thing is you, you spoke to people who are involved in the industry. And it interested me that Mr. Lark said that he produced a, a, uh, a, a second version of the famous Deep Throat. Uh, Deep Throat, Deep Throat. And one of the worst victims of pornography is Linda Lovelace. She's now 39 years of age, and she's a broken person, exploited for money, as these people are exploited for money, to produce that in 18 days. And she's absolutely ashamed of herself. And she says now, I would never have realised that decent people would have gone to see um, Deep Throat. Mm -hmm. Are you people who appear in them, are you mindful of Linda Lovelace's uh, experience? Yeah. 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 You clearly don't feel exploited when you're doing all this for the cameras. No, well, I wouldn't be doing it if I was feeling exploited at all, and nor would Ellen, you know. I've been around enough to know, you know, if you're going to be exploited, we wouldn't have done it in the first place. Do you think that? Uh, Peter, I was going to carry that point a bit further. Um, I'm speaking in terms of um, as being the National Women's Officer for the Shop Assistant Union, which is Australia's largest union. Now, rather than having, say, concerns um, whether or not particular actors are exploited, what we tend to have greater concerns over is the um, exploited, exploitative fashion in which women are portrayed in these videos. How do you mean? Um, the types of roles in which women are cast. That's very submissive. Submissive roles, also cast um, in the sense of pretty much generally solely as sex objects. Now, one of the problems we have as a trade union, and we represent about 150,000 women members, 
is um, to try and achieve equal employment opportunities in the workplace. So on the one hand, the types of um, videos that portray women simply as submissive sex roles are giving messages to the general community about how women should be perceived. And yet on the other hand, government, unions, a number of other bodies are saying, no, women now should not be perceived in this narrow context. They are capable of achieving in a much broader range of areas. Yes, all right. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, some of you over here might like to comment on that because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a point that's worth developing, I think. I agree that there is going to be some films where you will see a woman and she will be submissive. There will also be films where you'll see a male and he will be submissive. Now, I think you've got a fairly equal proportion of both. When you talk about women being uh, typecast, well, I'm afraid that's a reflection of society. Now, I'm not saying that that should be a good reflection and that we shouldn't educate people to try and raise the role of women in society. Right? I'm all for that. But when you have a woman who's thought to trade as a housewife, I think that's because there is a very large number of women who are indeed housewives. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, some of you people who make these, some of the, you who make them, direct them and so on, uh, to, to what extent are women shown in a submissive role here? And to what extent are men also being exploited? Nobody wants to comment on that? Okay, we'll go back over here. Right. Bill does discriminate against women. Um, also, these films do have actors uh, defecating and urinating on each other. I'd also like to make the point that the, the actors here say that they quite enjoy this work. We must remember that they are paid by the pornography industry. If they didn't say that, they would be out of a job, I think. Oh. We are not being paid. Um, but getting back to discrimination, um, it, there is here, um, our civil, the civil liberties of women, I believe, are at risk here. We are up against the large conglomerates who can advertise and put out a false image of women across Australia, and they're doing that very successfully. When we want to put across our point of view, we have to put paid advertisements in the Canva time saying, we don't like this material, we list the films and say they have this in them to educate the public and we don't like it. All right. We're not like that. So it's our civil liberties that we're talking about as women. And these conglomerates can do whatever they like and we have to sell lamingtons to raise money to put ads in the paper. Dear me. <laughs> okay, in the back. Jan McGuinness, you wanted to make a point over here? The word degradation to me suggests um, putting a woman in a situation that she doesn't want to be in, uh, a rape or forced, forced sexual activity. Now, you won't find anything like that in an X-rated movie. What I was going to say was I believe you people are barking up the wrong tree. I believe that the problem lies with violent sexual R-rated movies that you can walk into your local video shop and pick up on your local video shop shelf and don't have to prove your age. But are you convinced them. in your mind that non-violent erotica is not degrading to women? I mean, yes, certainly I do. I mean, we're, we're, are... we're living in the 20th century. Um, believe it or not, women these days are actually allowed to enjoy sex. Uh, maybe 50 years ago they weren't allowed to. These days they are allowed to say, yes, I can have an orgasm and yes, I enjoyed that. Right. But to what extent um, are women shown in very submissive situations here? I mean, to what extent are women well, the sex objects in these truth, movies? Um, I, I would say that in 90% of the movies that I've ever seen, the woman has been the dominant person in the X-rated movie. In other words, the woman says what goes. Now, Is this what men want? I'll bring some of you consumers in here. I mean, do men want to see women taking the leading role in lovemaking and sex? I think, I, I think in a lot of cases they do. Um, a lot of the people that I used to sell to were married couples and the husband would ring up and say, you know, my wife's lost interest or has no interest in sex anymore. Uh, sometimes they'd watch an X-rated movie and it'd spark things up a little bit. Um, I think from the female point of view, it can actually remind the woman, hey, I'm here and, and I'm part of this relationship. All right, look, I want to move it on at this point because um, many of the people who said that they enjoy watching these videos said that they find them erotic, they find them sexually stimulating. Now, uh, some of you people that want these X-rated videos banned uh, take that one step further and say it then leads to um, either promiscu promiscuous sexual acts or it either leads to uh, domestic violence or to uh, sexual assault out in the community. Now, what evidence can any of you bring to bear to support that sort of argument? Yes, it's a bad. Uh, viewing porn is the first step to rape. It's a great rape. It degrades women. Therefore, it's all right. They're low. Therefore, it's all right to rape them, to assault them, to 
sexually molesting at work, many cases of sexual harassment at work. And I'd like to remind you that the Nazis had a huge program degrading the Jews before all the violence started against them. So the X-rated give the impression that every woman is available. Yes, yes. definitely. What is not sexual material, it's male hatred of women. And I think it's important to be clear that that can appear in a variety of forms. To concentrate only on sexually explicit material is to say that rape is about something sexual. Rape's about power and violence. And I think it's important to see that there is just as much degradation of women in margarine commercials as there is in sexual, sexually explicit material. Okay, but look, the point we're discussing here is, do any of you have any evidence to, to, to link sexual offences, sexual assault, sexual crimes, with the sort of material that people watch in X-rated videos? Thousands and thousands of studies, and also about ten commissions of inquiry around the world which show which come generally to the conclusion, which I think most of the members of my profession believe, that there isn't a relationship between sexually explicit material and rape. It is true in Australia that between 1974 and the present, there's been a big rise in rape. But I think the evidence shows that the reason for the rise is, first of all, because women are now quite rightly reporting uh, sexual assault more than they were in the past. I think, secondly, the sexual laws, uh, sexual rape laws have been broadened, so uh, that's one of the reasons for the increase. But the third reason, I think, is because there were, about 1974, far more young people in the population. I think most people in my position would say that the evidence simply isn't there. Just one final point, too. You can look at countries like Denmark, for example, which have very, very uh, permissive laws on sexually explicit material, and they have very low rates of rape. You can look at uh, states like Queensland, to bring it uh, closer to home, which have very harsh censorship laws. They had very high rates of rape, as did many southern United States, uh, where there were very um, weak laws on, sorry, very strong laws on censorship, mm. but high rates of rape. So it's a very complex matter, and I think what the, the last speaker said is very important. Rape, is, rape and domestic violence is as much about power as it is about sex. Mm. And, but in a sense, we're also talking, I think the, some of the people here are also talking about the notion that uh, the X-rated video give the impression to men that every woman is available. And you can bowl over and have a woman technically because she's dying for it. You can get that from advertising. And you can get that from uh, much material which isn't censored X as well. I don't really think uh, X-rated material gives that particularly, especially when you consider X-rated material in terms of media content as a whole is only worth $25 million a year as against a billion dollars in the in the straight video industry. Right. So I don't really think that's an argument you can sustain. Right. Yes, you, you you were asking about evidence of the yes. link. Um, the main reason that there is no uh, evidence uh, recorded is that the people like Paul Wilson are simply not going to the right place and looking for the evidence. <laughs> uh, uh, well, what, what evidence? The Queen, evidence? Queen, yes. count, Queen's prosecutor in Victoria, I think Richard Reid, uh, is currently comp uh, putting together a dossier of every case that goes over his desk um, where sexual violence has been linked to uh, the viewing of pornographic videos, yeah. and uh, and he contends that there is a very definite uh, link. Now, if he doesn't know what he's talking about, we can show you thousands of clippings from newspapers where judges and magistrates have, have said uh, that there was a definite link between the uh, behaviour of the sexual offender and the viewing of pornographic material. Okay. Yeah. Right, Ridley? I think what we've got to look at here is that we are talking about filming a perfectly beautiful action between two people. The fact that it's filmed is degradation in itself. You're right about what you said. Um, I read that myself in the paper the other day. I would just like to add to what you've commented on that in 1960s, rape was the touching of women's genitals and intercourse. Now rape is the insertion of coke bottles which are then smashed in the woman's vagina and forcing the woman to have anal sex. Oh. Now there's no question about it. If you say a little bit's fine, then an awful lot's got to be fine too, and that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, but sorry to interrupt your kind of thought there, but, but is there any real evidence to suggest that if I watch uh, a whole lot of uh, X-rated videos, I'm likely to go out and rape someone or to molest someone okay, against well, their will? Well, it depends on whether you are on your own. And if you are a single man, if you have a wife, you will probably mutually um, excite each other and mutually come to some sort of... I'll have a sexual outlet. Yeah. But if you haven't got a sexual outlet, you okay, may well one. go out and find a prostitute if, you're, if the woman is very lucky, mm. or you will pick up some kid if you are watching some filth on, on child pornography, or you will bash up and rape the first woman you can there's find. There's very, very strong evidence that, in fact, many people, especially men who watch alone X-rated videos, rather than going out to the streets and raping people, 
actually get their vicarious satisfaction through the watching. And you can say that some people are put off rape and other assaults against women by that, by watching. Now, I'm not using that as an argument for X-rated videos. I'm simply saying one form might cancel out the other. Well, Donna suggested yeah. this uh, before when you were talking. You suggested that the excitement, the sexual excitement you get from watching these X-rated videos in, a, in itself is almost a substitute for the sex act. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, to me, it proves like that. I don't know with many other people, but to me personally, yeah. And that's the point I'm making, that it's addictive. So but what's, what's, what's wrong, wrong with that? Huh? Is it, no, there's what's there's wrong with feeling that? Because yeah. you can feel that and you don't have to go out. I know plenty of people in Melbourne Dale that have been done in for rape. And yet when they've gotten out, they've sat there and read pornographic books, watched pornographic blue and blue movies, whatever you want to call them. And yet 99.9% of the raping to kill to where I was brought up from went down the drain because most of those people were watching them. It's only simply because people have a problem finding relationships, had young girls out on the street walking around in short mini skirts and things like that that make these rape situations happy, not magazines, so books really and things like that. Short skirts, yes, therefore. That is. But no, wait a minute. A number, of, a number of you people who talked about uh, watching these videos said that you watch them as a couple and you they're almost like a foreplay. They are stimulating and they do lead to sex. Uh, in that way. Now, now, I think this is a fairly important point here. I mean, do they stimulate you to the point where you want to have sex? And what happens if you are by yourself? Storyline, and it doesn't arouse us, then, you know, we switch back to boring television. Yeah, but but it does arouse you. Well, we may... It do depends do. on the mood. I mean, it's like having a good bottle of wine, you know? For some people, it's... it's uh, it's an aphrodisiac and, and you know, a video can work the same way for a couple we're talking I'm talking about a couple at home like my wife will be watching a movie and it's got a good storyline my wife might get excited by that movie and I may not Hmm. Does that mean because I'm the man in the relationship, I just say, well, that didn't interest me. We yeah, but I'm saying if you're watching it by yourself, you know, you're all talking about watching Well, then couple, if I get so excited and, and I've got no relief of that excitement, well, I either masturbate or I either just, you know, don't worry about it. Or, you know, I wouldn't watch the movie unless I wanted oh, to get excited. Even more hmm. explicit so you can get more sexually excited and more addicted yeah. to the shit and the film. Yes, over here. Uh, yes, I understand it. A lot of the, um, the studies Dennis Stevenson talks about have been criticised because the researcher has gone into the experiments with the outcome already in mind. That is, he's been biased um, in some well, way. There is the major U.S. major U.S. government hearing. Yeah. But we will always find academics disagreeing with other on every subject. We know that when it comes down to a practical point of view, who would disagree with the fact that what we see influences what we do? Every educator in Australia knows that people are very greatly influenced by watching the content of X-rated videos. You've watched, All right. this is you've watched a lot of X-rated videos, this, Dennis, and you haven't committed rape. Right. This is why, <laughs> this is why advertising, <laughs> this is why advertisers spend hundreds of millions of dollars on television because they know that what we see influences what we do. Mm. Well, look, I want to move the discussion along from this point because we're running tight on our time. One final point before we move on then. While I appreciate the views of being tried to be made about a causal link, the link is probably a third party link, which is that the people who mostly watch pornography are the same people as mostly commit rape, and that's men. That's the link, not a causal relationship. No, but we've got at all. couples here, we've got lots of women. I know there's a lot of same. couples here, and I'm glad to see that that's, that's being, you know, represented, that women mm. aren't <laughs> non sexual beings. Mm. But I think you will find that the majority of people who are in that category of regular viewers of erotic or pornographic material are men. And it so happens that rape committed by men. They're the ones who do the raping and that's because of the power relationship between men and women, not because sex exists and is around. Yeah. Sex doesn't cause rape. But look, how do you people who are opposed to these X-rated videos, how do you explain the fact that people who have watched a lot of them, I mean even people like Dennis Stevenson in the course of his work, don't go out and commit sexual offences? I mean Lisa uh, Nisky, who's got three and a half thousand of them, hasn't he? Well, you, you could say the same thing about the tobacco industry 40 years ago. There wasn't a causal link between um, tobacco smoking and cancer. It may take 10 years for a causal link between pornography and violent behaviour to, to be brought out. And at the moment in this country, that data is not being collected. It's not being collected by the Institute of Criminology, according to Mr Richard Reed QC in Melbourne, and he hopes that soon 
um, they will get a grant and start collecting data that mm. maybe in 10 years we will see... So in the meantime, are you arguing then that this may only affect some people yes. to go out and commit sex trafficking? Yes, of course it's 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 inadequate. If it affects one, if one yes. woman is raped because of it, it should be banned. What price no. women? Okay, which leads me to the point I was really going to move on to a moment ago. If you do, I mean, again, Stephen Stephenson and the rest of you who want to see these X-rated videos banned, if you succeed, are we in danger of going from bad to worse? I mean, Australia no. already has no. a thriving no. No. pirate industry in uh, X-rated, well, they're not rated at all because they haven't got through the classification system. You leave it open to the backyarders. Peter, yeah. I, I want to take you back to the very first thing you said in introducing this program. You said that Canberra was called Porn, Cam Porn Berra. And the reason for that is the mega bucks involved in this industry that exploits women. Now we would have that the banning would have taken place except there was a there was a movement by the by the X-rated video industry to really make it attractive for to stay in Canberra by almost saying tax us and you'll get two million dollars a year for the for the for the Canberra government. Now in fact what's happened is that they've got the dollars and Bernard Caleri has got the cents. A miserable little bit of money to yeah, come sure. to us. And well, that's the, the point reason is, why it wasn't banned. The point is, while we have a legal industry, at least it passes the videos pass through the censorship board. They are viewed by people like David Haynes. They're given a classification and there are some enforceable standards. If you ban them, you then presumably the censorship board has nothing to do with it. It's open slather for anyone who wants to make anything. Peter, it's important. No, sorry, Robbie Swan. Yeah. Can I just say first of all, it was Flavio Elke Peterson that coined the word porn bearer, so I don't have any how much support of it had in the rest of Australia. But anyway, uh, in the course of lobbying for this industry over a couple of years, I talked to individually about a hundred different politicians. And I can say for a fact that at the beginning, that 80% of those didn't have a clue as to the difference between an R-rated and an X-rated video. And in many ways, the reason for going out and lobbying the politicians at that point was simply to make clear that X was non-violent. They didn't know that before that. Oh. Now, having said that, also, I can say that out of the group of politicians who vehemently oppose X and who speak out about it quite a bit, that there are a good proportion of those who actually get off on it. Oh. Yeah, but the point is, what happens if you close it down? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find out here whether you can succeed in banning these things or whether you simply then uh, uh, allow the backyard operators to have an open go. Um, being involved in the industry, I, I spend a lot of time coming back and going to Sydney and Melbourne, and uh, we already know that the industry is very, very large in Sydney and Melbourne, but much bigger than Canberra's ever the seen. The illegal industry. The illegal industry. Much bigger than Canberra's ever seen and ever will see, um, where nothing is controlled. It's all done in the underground, all done on the back streets through pubs, bars, wharfs and unions. And uh, currently none of it's classified. And we can show you proof after proof after proof of the product that comes out wouldn't even reach our classification board. Yes. Yeah, but right. what we're saying is that you can't, you can't, by banning it, you can't get rid of it. You can ban the point is it's been banned in New South Wales and the, the illegal industry is thriving. Yes, well, I'm very pleased with the attorney that that gentleman made that remark because our police advice is, of course, that the industry thrives outside Canberra and we're not the porn capital, and I say that again. Secondly, Father Wright rather demeaned himself, I thought, in accusing our government of seeking money from this issue. As the, as the film industry uh, knows, we applied, not achieving a total ban, uh, a 40% tax. More than six of the current outlets in the ACT have collapsed, gone into liquidation or shut in the last few months. The fact is the industry is on the decline dramatically and significantly in the territory. But the, in the industry, I think, makes the point that they're being throttled because they're right. obeying the rules, they're paying the tax. The backyard operators are thriving because they're not paying any tax. Right. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, just having me get a um, you've already banned things like child pornography and other things like that. So if you're implying that by banning um, the other X-rated videos in Canberra, you're going to set up a huge underground thing, well, then why don't we open up the restrictions? What about heroin? We ban that. We ban other drugs because we've seen the problems that they create in society. Why are we saying for this issue that we believe that there is a problem, that we're saying, no, get rid of the banning, it's going to go underground? At least with that, we restrict who can view it. It's harder to obtain as with drugs and other things like that. 
what, so, so I'm just trying to make clear what you're saying there. You're saying that, all right, ban it and there will be an illegal industry, but you then have to be prepared to stamp down yes, on the illegal industry. Yes, and you reduce advertising. The audience is going to be lim far more limited by, actually, by banning it, as with things that the society has decided on, drugs and other things. You, you say, no, no, it's not. Did you say, did you move the mic down, please? As I said before, it's human nature. The minute you ban something, the person who really wants it will go to great lengths to get it. And the person the person who is doing it illegally will go to even greater lengths to make sure he gets it. It's better to keep it uh, controlled like want, it is. Whether it be drugs or whether it be pornography or whether it be prostitution, isn't a very happy history. I, it seems to me that what we have to do is to sensibly regulate it and also use educator, education to try and turn people off it. I'm all for offered saying to uh, those who oppose my position, let's try education. I worry about re I worry about more laws because more laws doesn't necessarily mean more order. We can see we've seen that in drugs now, where drugs have saturated the country and where organised crime is rife because we have banned drugs so heavily. I think we have to be very careful before we do that with what's called uh, pornography. I'd like to. Can I just go to a member of the police force here because I think their point of view might be interesting at this point. Uh, General Crombie, you're a member of the sexual assault in it, I know, but would you relish the thought of having to um, uh, police uh, 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 well, a sex video industry? No, not particularly. I totally agree with what Dr Wilkins is saying about education at a lower level, so, mm. of educating the younger uh, not to commit these offences. In the course of your work with the sexual assault unit, have you found any evidence that people who, uh, men who've committed sexual assaults against women have been stimulated by watching... Uh, Videos? No, we haven't. Um, Mr. Stevenson came to us two years ago asking for the same same evidence, and he was asked to uh, uh, sorry, he was requested to ask it to collect that evidence, and he has not so far made that request of it. Mm. I cannot confirm one way or another yeah. whether but, that is the case. But th this does now bring us back to the point: is if if the legal industry is banned. Can an illegal industry that would undoubtedly thrive in the backyards in the black market, can it be policed? Well, it's unfortunate uh, if we hadn't got any police from other jurisdictions. The legal approach from Canberra, we haven't had any great problems with uh, because the... Because you've got a legal industry. That's correct. Mm. Now, we, we're very careful. We're not moralising here, saying we, whether we agree or not. But the problems we've had have come from across our borders it's from, from uh, an illegal industry. From the mailing uh, mail order uh, system, where people from outside of the ACC are using the, the mail system. But you surely must have a view on this now, because if you're confronted with the possibility of banning the legal industry, you are then faced with having to police. I would like illegal to, to prostitution. I think. Uh, will not go away, and uh, I think to ban it, we, we will have greater problems. But then I come back to you people who there want to ban it. There are very few people in Australia who would understand where to get child pornography, bestiality, snuff movies, and others. So the question when we say ban, obviously what you can do is drastically reduce the amount of Something. the production. The big problem is that the every state in Australia has banned X-rated videos, every single Attorney General. And the ACT is being used to virtually violate their local laws by allowing the mail order business to operate from the ACT. So what we need to do is, if we talk about um, child pornography and banning doesn't work, does that mean we should legalise it to bring it out in the open? Obviously it's a nonsense. What we need to do is ban them. Yes? Can I, can I just say a few words for the uh, educators, if I could? Um, I, I think it's a very pessimistic view to say that it's just human nature. Surely with education we can do something to, to help our young people and I think in the debate tonight the young people have been forgotten, they've been left out. And it's precisely... Well, on that mainly because young people aren't supposed to be watching it. We're talking about under 18 years of age. <laughs> right. Yes, it was readily available to them. Yes, and in fact that's how our research into this whole issue started because the legislation that emanates from Canberra is in fact flawed. And the, the, the Commonwealth legislation, the Postal Services Act, should be amended to, uh, to ban or to, to support what the, all the State Attorney General is saying in other states. Ban X rated videos. Mm -hmm. yes, you, you see the dangers in the mail order system where, yes. where young, where minors can get their hands on it. Correct. So what do you say then? Keep it within the system and put it in mainstream seminars. That's right. cinemas, we where we it think be. it belongs in the mainstream seminars. We not in the male the age group that goes into. We're fear. not saying it doesn't exist. What we're saying is that it doesn't belong in the mail order business because the, because the the controls are too loose. 
Well, any right. any child of any age can solicit this material by mail. Mm. Well, okay, uh, Dan McGinnis, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting this side of it. I believe that the um, majority of Australian parents are responsible with their children. Um, a parent wouldn't leave a bottle of tablets lying around where their son or daughter could pick it up, would they? No, but Donna, um, Donna watched her first video. Yeah, well, 14, okay, so you, you may get acceptance, but I think it's back totally back. up to down, isn't it? Sorry, can we get a microphone up the back, please? I think it's that children are just left alone as uh, working people everywhere and children that have access to pornography, and also that there's cases where they can just readily avail, get it through the mail and go, go over the counter. We have heard cases where they go over the counter and get it. And um, that's not right. Children shouldn't be exposed to yeah, but look, The point I'm trying to get you to uh, just comment on here is, would we be going from what many of you say is bad to even worse if you take away all the controls by banning it? Well, the bans haven't worked interstate, and I take great exception to the suggestions that every other attorney has banned it. True, other legislatures have banned it, and when you arrive at the airport in those states, I won't name any, you'll get the, the booklet that says what's on in the city, turn to the last three pages in several of the capital cities of Australia tomorrow, and you'll find where to get your ex rated in those cities where those attorneys are alleged to have banned it. So it's simply not true. The second thing is we're missing. The Commonwealth could solve this matter tomorrow. The mail order business lies wholly within the control, the federal control of the federal authorities. There is an on-mailing system in the Territory w without charge that the, post, uh, the Australia Post provide for these nefarious concerns who are using the ACT uh -huh. as a post box. Uh -huh. And they, uh, of course, run a major business from interstate through the Territory, through the Australia Post provision of free onward forwarding of mail. Secondly, two days or three days before self-government here, the federal government closed the door on uh, possibilities our government could take by passing a Publications Control Act and in the Self-Government Act, excluding classification, mm. unlike every other part of Australia, from the essential function of our government. So um, you're saying close the well, mail order, Lee Cole. You didn't I'm close speaking, the whole business. I'm speaking for myself as attorney. I do not believe a total ban will work. It hasn't worked in history. And therefore, we must look to the regulation mm. and we must have a, a further classification in the violent R category and the X category. Sure. The Commonwealth yes, should that provide that. Okay. David Haynes, how do you react to all this? The problems the police have are certainly enormous. Just recently, we have had an approach... Controlling the illegal industry. Yes, indeed. We have had an approach from uh, two state bodies, uh, police bodies, in the last uh, couple of months. One of them estimates that some 30,000 tapes are there for the seizing by their forces, uh, and they are required before being able to prosecute to submit those tapes to us for classification. Uh, we deal with 3,500 of the legitimate uh, industry yeah. material a year. To cope with a further 30,000 would be a so daunting it's, it's just too big to be handled. Yes. But in the meantime, of course, you're talking about, what, how many did you say? 300,000 tapes yeah. to be seized. 30,000 30, tapes. 30,000 30, tapes just to in, be seized. That's just in one And these city. are illegal tapes that haven't been submitted to the censorship board, carry no classification. Some of them may do, but, but they are being distributed from a state in which the material is ah. so essentially you know, we, banned. We, in the Territory, I know as attorney who is involved in this trade. It's not a trade I like, personally. They're over there, most of them. I know who they are. I know basically what their income is. I know who their employees are tax. and their actors are. Well, they don't pay much tax at the moment because they're going broke, I believe, or something's wrong, but we're looking at them. But the fact of the matter is our police force know who yeah. the players you are in this territory. I challenge all the other attorneys to tell me what's going on in their territory and what the undercurrents there are. Mm. Peter, okay, okay, so where does that take it? Yes, uh, mm. well, perhaps somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Somebody hasn't spoken yet. Someone more? Yes, you haven't spoken yet. Well, if, if, you, if you ban the, uh, the X-rated videos, you immediately have a, a set of people that deal with it as lawbreakers. And what I want to do is ask the people that are in that, that have got vested interest in it, what are they going to do if it does get banned? Are they going to slaughter the law and continue in there or not? Well, what do you do? John Lark, you're the biggest of them? Yes, obviously. <clears throat> in our case, it would be very difficult for business the size of ours to go underground. I'm aware of how the underground works uh, and uh, obviously the problems involved uh, with people who are operating underground. They, they have uh, businesses which are basically mobile. 
the size of our business would make it impossible for us to go underground. We'd move to education material, R-rated material, and uh, even consider going offshore into state, obviously. I mean, uh, whatever avenues are available to our 200,000 odd membership, of which 70% are couples, we'd want to still service. Dennis Stevenson makes the point that if it becomes illegal, mm -hmm. there is no advertising allowed, so therefore it's uh, less widely available to well, consumers. By, Fewer by people legislation, know about it. it's not supposed to be any advertising now. Yeah. Um, in New South Wales, it's illegal to carry an ad for an X-rated tape, uh, and yet it is uh, blatantly advertised. I think what's important there is that there's no advertising for heroin, but there's a lot of heroin around. So the problem is that it's so easy to duplicate tapes. If you make it illegal, any operator can, off the back of a truck, set up a, a thriving illegal market. I, like the attorney here, would very much prefer to see a regulated industry which the authorities, the police and the government can get to, rather than just opening up, opening up the floodgates like we have with heroin. All right, look, on that point, I've got a rabbit because we're, we're well out of time. We'll watch with great interest to see what decision the ACT Assembly finally makes on this one. Thank you all very much for coming along and uh, we'll see you again next Wednesday night. Good night.